and I worked up the courage that was necessary for me to do that and I made that decision and then I would say within about three months I felt remarkably better mentally and physically and then within about six months the only lingering issue I had was acne. Apart from that I felt fantastically better mentally. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Clark. My mission is to inspire, motivate, and empower you. Most of all, I want you to wake up. So with functional medicine, we can discover what causes infertility and eventually reverse the condition. Today, I'm welcoming Holly Griggs Ball to the podcast. And we're digging into the impact of hormonal birth control on fertility. So Holly is the author of the best-selling book, Sweetening the Pill, or How We Got Hooked on Hormonal Birth Control. She is a consulting producer on the documentary inspired by her book, directed by Abby Epstein, and executive produced by Ricky Lake, which is currently in production and due for release in 2018. Holly's op-ed on the pill and mental health side effects for The Guardian was ranked as the most read comment piece of 2016. The story went viral, became a Twitter moment, and as a result, she was featured by the Washington Post and interviewed for NPR and CBC. Vice named her the poster girl for a movement of women abandoning the pill in favor of contraceptives that don't wreak havoc on their body and mind. Holly's work has been featured in both American and British Vogue. She's collaborated on an article about the pro-period revolution with Alanis Morissette and produced a piece on male birth control options with Mayim Balik. Holly was a speaker at Cycles and Sex in New York City and LA and leads workshops on going off hormonal birth control. She's also a brand ambassador for the Daisy Fertility Tracker. Check out her website at sweeteningthepill.com. Before we jump into today's show, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this to make sure you never miss an episode. Hey, Holly, excited to have you on the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So today, if you could, you could share with me uh, your own story of how you came to this work and um, yeah, really your, your own journey with this. Yeah. So this all came about because of my own experience with the birth control pill. I was a journalist in the film movie world um, before mm. I started writing about women's health. I had taken the pill for 10 years and I took a very popular pill at the time called Yasmin, which was really kind of sold to me as it were by my doctor as uh, a brand new birth control pill that wasn't going to have the same side effects that I'd experienced with the other kinds I tried Um, and ironically after two years it ended up having worse side effects than any other pill I tried. I had very severe especially mental health side effects but also some sort of insidious lingering physical side effects and that experience um, once I'd figured out that my health was being impacted by Yasmin um, was a real eye-opener for me and made me start doing my own research, my own kind of journalistic investigation into what the pill did to my body, how it worked, why it had these side effects. And that led me to pitch an article on it to a magazine that I don't think is around anymore, which is called Easy Living. And I wrote a piece called uh, something like the side effects that you don't know about. And for that, I did a lot of different interviews with research scientists and doctors. And I learned so much that I had an overflow of research that I then decided to put into a blog called Sweetening the Pill with the subtitle, Who Am I When I'm Not on the Pill? And that subtitle only came about when I finally, after about six to eight months, I think it was, decided to go off the pill completely after you know a, a total of 10 years of use. Um, and, and that's what led me so the blog went on for a few years. Um, I did, you know, articles here and there and guest blogs for websites and things. And then it slowly developed into a book proposal. Um, and then it became a, a published book. And then it actually got optioned quite soon after that to be a feature documentary by uh, the team behind the Business of Being Born film, which is Aiken Abby Epstein. Mm-hmm. And I think, and I've, I've read that it's, it's getting ready to launch in 2018, the film, or where, where are we on production? We're in, pre- we're in post-production now, so I don't think it will be 2018, but hopefully not long. <laughs> okay, yeah. No, that's exciting. Really, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so maybe kind of dig into a little bit for, for us, if you can, share some of the, um, the, the side effects that you experience after having, using Yasmin, or I guess what they call it, they refer to it as Yaz. Yeah, Yaz is slightly different, but it's the oh, same. Okay. 
compo component that causes the side effects or, or is, is the reason why the side effects are more severe, which is drospirinone, which is the synthetic progesterone or progestin, which makes it, sets it apart from other kinds. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, there's lots of generics with different names. But yeah, at the time, so I had a two-year experience, basically a build-up, um, and it took me that long to figure out that the Yasmin was causing my problems, but I had everything from really bad anxiety, panic attacks, um, a sort of agoraphobia, social anxiety, uh, depression. Uh, a lot of issues was like just not being able to cope basically with everyday, day-to-day -day life. And then physically, I was very fatigued all the time. Um, I had muscle aches. I had like, like what felt like flu um for about a week every month and I just generally felt very under the weather one of the major things was this, I got constant urinary tract infections mm. which meant I had to take a lot of time off work and I was always getting sick <laughs> and uh so between like just my sort of slowly deteriorating physical health and then my escalating mental health issues I really, really was under the weather with Yasmin and, you know, some of it was quite severe and some of it I don't, didn't even realise what was actually uh, very much tied to the Yasmin until I was able to come off completely and, you know, six months or so after that withdrawal period of coming off the pill. I'd had side effects on other brands of pill. They were, from my point of view at the time, mostly relatively minor. And so the extremity of the side effects on that particular pill was really what, as I said before, kick-started my desire to know more. So how did you decide then that that was related to the pill? You just, how did you make that correlation? So there was a really helpful website at the time. This was kind of slightly pre-Facebook, etc. cetera. So um, it was called Yaz and Yasmin Survivors and a, a wonderful woman who'd had a horrible horrible experience on Yaz had started this support group online and women just shared their stories and got support from people over the internet and the stories were so similar to mine it wasn't just sort of general touch points but they were very eerily similar in the way that people specifically the way people felt emotionally the kinds mm -hmm. of thoughts they were having the kinds of feelings they had the kind of situations they found themselves in that that really made me think oh okay so there's something going on here um, and I got to that forum by a very brief casual conversation with um, one of my best friends who had come off herself because she felt that it was affecting her mental health and she just said she didn't really feel depressed but she felt very kind of apathetic and uninterested in everything going on in her life and demotivated and um, it was that conversation that led me to the forum and then the forum that really made me put two and two together. Right. And then so, so you, but you were on it for two years, feeling all these lot of mental health issues as well as, as you said, fatigue, flu-like symptoms, U UTIs, which I've been there on that one. So your immune system was really kind of compromised during this time. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. I was 25. Oh, wow. I was had a job I loved. I was in a relationship. I was, I, you know, everything was should have been great right um but it was funny because it took me two years to put those that two and two together and i blamed everything i possibly could apart from the pill up until that point it was certainly wasn't the first thing i thought of it was the last thing i thought of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then as you then as you came off how did you then start to what, what did you notice with your health when you came off yeah, so I actually went from Yasmin to another kind of pill called Femidet because that's what my doctor offered me when I went and told her I'd have these terrible side effects. The only thing she felt that she could offer was another kind of pill, mm -hmm. um, which was probably my fifth, fifth brand of pill in my lifetime at that point. Um, so I did stay on that for six months and the side effects were, I'd say, about 20% lessened by just switching pills. Mm -hmm. But I think at that point, a lot of damage had been done in terms of my health over time and due to Yasmin. And so I, got, I, I actually moved over to the States to get married to my husband. And I had some time uh, where I didn't have work visa so it was an opportunity for me to start this blog and um, put together my research and as I started the blog I realized what I really wanted to do was just stop taking the pill completely and I worked up the courage that was necessary for me to do that and I made that decision and then I would say within about three months I felt remarkably better better mentally and physically and then within about six months the only lingering issue I had was acne 
Mm. Apart from that, I felt fantastically better mentally and definitely physically. I was in good health. I was taking care of myself. I was exercising. I was eating well. And I just felt, you know, I, I, I felt so much better that it was life changing, really, which, mm. what, which is what made me continue to do the work that I'm doing. You know, many women were reaching out to me via the blog to say they were having the same kind of experience um, coming off, especially in terms of their emotional and mental health, just feeling so much lighter or able to access kind of contentment or joy or excitement liking feeling the whole range of emotions just feeling more motivated more energetic more creative and more able to do my work my writing didn't have that kind of brain fog I'd had on the pill um, that blocked me from doing what I was you know was my career yeah so it was a really life-changing experience and very dramatic and now I'm some eight years off the pill and Mm -hmm. I can't I mean I I just I it's like night and day and I've certainly not had a an unstressful life since I came off you know I've moved countries I've moved cities I've changed careers I've done a lot of different things that would you know would have been difficult for a lot of people to cope with and I've coped with it very well which just shows to me how much of a personality change it was for me to be on the pill and then to come off and to realize oh I'm not actually having those issues I'm not that person that's not my type that's not my personality type. Those not my struggles that I do should be dealing with. Like that was the pill all the time. Yeah. May I ask why you decided to go on the pill in the first place? Was it more to prevent pregnancy or was it? So I was about 17 um, and my, I had two older sisters who were both on the pill. My mum is, you know, was a, you know, 20s and 1960s and still very much feels like the pill is liberating and empowering for women obviously having three daughters didn't want any of us to get uh, uh, accidentally pregnant and so she felt like she would encouraging she was encouraging me to do the, she was doing the responsible thing by encouraging me to go on it but also in my school I, w- I went to an all-girls school high school um, it was very much uh, like a, a sort of um uh, sort of way of get, getting into sort of adult was the idea of taking the pill so most of us weren't having sex it was an all-girls school but probably about five percent of us had boyfriends but it was almost like a rite of passage to get a prescription for the pill and it was all you know who was on the pill who wasn't on the pill was a big discussion and you know if you weren't having sex then taking the pill was like the next best thing essentially and so you know it was partly my you know my mother's influence partly the culture of being teenage girls 16 17 years old which I still think is the same now and also I did have heavy periods I had heavy quite painful periods which a lot of people in their teens deal with um and you know I didn't have any other recourse apart from taking painkillers so the idea of doing it for that reason as well was very appealing yeah, and I've shared this before on the podcast about my daughter who she was 16 and she's had some heavy periods and we've changed her diet and things like that. But she, and because I'm in sort of the natural health field, she's kind of like, oh, mom, that stuff's silly. You know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, well, let's go to the doctor and see what they say about these heavy periods. And literally we're in there for about five minutes. He asked her a few questions and his first thing is, well, why don't we put you on the pill? And then she looked over at me, I, I, you know, went, oh, okay. You're right. So with that, with you know, any kind of mm. investigation as to why or what exactly was happening there. So it's, it's a bandaid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Definitely. So as far as, so you talked about, so you were on it for two years and what are some, what are some, and over 80% of women are prescribed the pill and I was on it as well. I, yes, cause at I, some I, point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I had heavy periods and then I had irregular periods and I was on a whole, a whole host of different pills as well because I had this acne that I wanted to get rid of. And they're like, okay, take the pill and it'll help with your acne, which it never did. (laughs) So like, what are some common short-term side effects of the pill? Um, Well, I think the ones that I always like to focus on the most are the mental health issues because, you know, a lot of women are diagnosed with mental health issues, especially young women. A lot of women are quite routinely prescribed anti-anxiety medication or antidepressants Um, and many of them if they if they think that it might be their pill are often discouraged from thinking that 
And so, you know, I, I often talk about, you know, that it's there's the depression and anxiety. And there was a fantastic large scale study that came out a couple of years ago now from Copenhagen um, that showed that, you know, women who are on the pill are likely to be diagnosed with clinical depression. And then another more recent study that said they are actually more likely to attempt suicide. And so, you know, it's, it's those levels of mental health issues that can be brought about by the pill for some women and obviously more prevalent in women with a history of mental health issues. But, you know, what's that saying these days when so many of us have problems with anxiety, especially right. depression? And, and then for me, it's also the spectrum of that. So, you know, sometimes we think, oh, well, depression is when you can't get out of bed and you can't do anything. But there's a whole spectrum. So, you know, it might be panic attacks. It might be really low self-esteem. It might be feeling paranoid about your friendships or your relationship. It might be obsessive thoughts or obsessive compulsive issues. It might just be feeling really low and down, not something you call depression, but that's how you would, that's how you would describe it. There's a lot of different variants on that. And for some women, it's just not feeling that great. It's feeling um, what they call anhedonia, which is just kind of like you don't feel horrible, but you feel like, like an inability to feel like really happy or excited or interested in anything. And the more women I the more women I, I meet to experience that then will experience a very extreme depression and then come off the pill and realize oh wow like I didn't realize how divorced I was from the world um how my experience of everything around me was changed so much um and I think that that's really important to know that you know it's not you don't have to be having like clinical depression to actually be experiencing those mental health issues and then I think also you know it's interesting when we talk about things like you know, are you getting these chronic infections and being and feeling ill and the weather all the time like I was? Because we don't think about it, but we think it's sort of like with many medications, we don't think how it has a whole body effect. So with the pill, what's happening is, yes, it's going in and it's basically changing your brain, how it switches off your body's production of sex hormones. So it's affecting your endocrine system, but it's also affecting, as you mentioned, your immune system as well as your metabolic system. And so it's making a lot of things change in your body because of those, the suppression of the production of hormones and the rise, the, the, your body's own rise and fall of those hormones is replaced with this synthetic flat stream of synthetic hormones which bear very little relation to the ones that your body would create on its own and that is you know where everything is integrated and interlinked and so that's where all of that comes from so you know there's really you know I've come across people who's had developed you know dairy allergies while being on the pill you know within a year of being off the pill they no longer have that issue or they've had trouble if they're you know if they are dancers or uh, weightlifters or something uh, active and physical in their lives they have trouble gaining muscle or being able to meet the fitness goals that they expect of themselves or other people of their age and and um, in the same context because of the effect of the pill on, on that part of the body as well and, and your ability to to gain muscle and things like that so there's so it's I think what's the important thing is that from my point of view, that if you're experiencing something that you find strange or is chronic or is new or perhaps seems a little like, oh, this is, seems to have got worse over years, not to, it's might, it might not be the pill, but the thing that we write, the place that we come from now is that we say it definitely isn't. Whereas I'd like to see us move that towards what it actually could be. So, if that's something that we should think about when we think about why is this happening, that should be one of the things we look to, to inve investigate for ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And the people that come to see us are, are dealing with infertility. And I would say a, a large majority of them have been on long-term birth control, which mm -hmm. can yeah. be a side effect as well. Infertility. What's, what's your experience with that? Or what have you seen over the long, the long Yeah. See, this is often, yeah, this is often something that, you know, is not discussed very much because it's assumed that, you know, it's a reversible method. So once you go off, then your fertility will bounce back and you'll get your periods back and your cycles back. 
And for me, my cycles did come back within about three months, which is relatively quickly. But in the work that I've done more recently as an ambassador with the Daisy company, which creates a, a fertility tracker, I do work with a lot of women now and you know obviously they're tracking their cycle quite closely and that we're seeing that it can take for some a certain number of women it can take many many more months than that even up to a year for anything to ha- to happen in terms of even getting an, a period let alone ovulating and so they'll come especially if they come off something like the implant or also sometimes the hormonal IUD can be tricky but implant or the shot is a very difficult one too they're not given any warning (laughs) they're told that you know you're going to be able to get pregnant right away or you you know make sure you don't get pregnant right away or you won't you'll get your period back immediately and there's so much confusion around that especially because women who use these methods are often told that they are having periods when what they're actually experiencing is withdrawal bleeds which don't have any physiological relation to periods Um, and so that confuses the matter even more and so you know then they're told oh well you haven't had a period for six six seven months or so you should probably go back on the pill to make your period come back which is just doesn't actually make any sense whatsoever Mm -hmm. but the gap of that ignorance means it can be filled by anything um so yeah no in my more recent experience i've seen that a lot and it's tricky because Basically, women think when they come off, it's like either they think they're just going to get pregnant right away or they get into this mindset of like, I have to detox my body from these synthetic hormones. And what you really need to do is, as I'm sure you know very well, is to get your body to make its own hormones again, which is actually a really different approach. Exactly. Yeah. And and there are people obviously that come off the pill and are able to get their period back right away and able to get pregnant. And people just come to me because they've been struggling Mm. with with fertility for years. And it's interesting to track as I ask that question as part of my my intake form, have you been on the birth control pill? And it's just, it is a large percentage that have been on it for 10, 20 years. And yeah, it's almost, and some, sometimes they were, a lot of the times they were placed on the birth control pill because they had something going on with their cycle. Right. And then you come yes. off and then I, that's it still hasn't been rectified as to what was happening in your teenage years. It hasn't mm-hmm. rectified. So that's either potentially gotten worse. Yeah. And the other thing is, is if you're put on it as a teenager, your reproductive system is still maturing. So you're basically, what a friend of mine says is like you're pressing a pause button and then you restart it and you haven't, your reproductive system hasn't done anything between that time. Mm-hmm. So then it needs to mature. So Yes, yeah, absolutely. A lot of teenagers are put on it and maybe they do have PCOS or endometriosis or something that's just undiagnosed and, and untreated because the pill is seen as the treatment. But of course, it doesn't actually do anything to the root cause. And then they come off and they're made to think that they're meant to be have preserved their fertility with the pill, which is another myth that's often bandied about a lot and unfortunately it's just not true and then yes you get this it's sort of this mess of like the health issues sometimes exacerbated health issues and then also just ignorance of what it is to have a fertile cycle Mm -hmm. so let's dig into um, gut health because there's studies linking gut health and, and nutrient levels to being on the pill that they've been compromised while you're on the pill Yes. Yeah, so, you know, normally, you know, where I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, it affects your metabolism. I mentioned a friend of mine who had a, developed a lactose intolerance, a dairy allergy, and then miraculously no longer has that problem, mm-hmm. interestingly enough. And also, you know, some recent research came out about the impact on uh, triggering Crohn's disease in women with certain susceptibility to Crohn's disease if they're on the pill, which is mm. quite significant. And we have the fact that it's affecting, because of that, it's affecting your nutrient levels, right? Because you're not able, the way it affects your gut, you're not able to absorb the nutrients you need to absorb. So that's why a lot of a lot of things that happen come about partly due to the nutrient deficiency with mental health. That can be tied back to B vitamin deficiency often, in part. 
And so, you know, there's a lot going on there as well. And I usually point people to uh, a couple of colleagues of mine that I, you know, have a great sort of naturopathic health co- or health coach background that really focus on, focuses on this. One is Lara Bryden, who wrote a book called Period Repair Manual, which is now in its second edition, which is a fantastic book that really just collates uh, many years of her working with women one-on-one in clinic coming off the pill and other hormonal birth control. And then Nicole Jardim, who has really great online resources. Um, and she talks a lot about the issues of coming off the pill and what that can affect. And certainly gut health is one of those things. Nutrient levels is definitely a, a part of that. There was a really fantastic book that came out a while ago called The Pill Problem, um, which really outlines like specifically what nutrients the pill will deplete and one of the things it says in the introduction is that all medications deplete nutrients it's one of the impacts of them but the pill is probably one of the number one or two on that list of of medications that do that and of course women take it day in day out for you know it can be decades you know you may start when you're 14 and not even think to come off until you're 30 or even 40 if you decide you know you're not going to have children Mm -hmm. and you may have children and go back on it so you've got many many years of that same effect it's not something you generally these days take short term yeah laura laura bryden i reached out to her to be on the podcast uh so the period repair manual i haven't read it yet but it's been on my radar and nicole jarday obviously obviously she's a health coach as well so she has a website fix your period so she's got great resources on there as well yeah we look at actually using functional testing so looking at food sensitivity testing looking at hormone testing you, you using the dutch test i've got the medical director from Precision mm-hmm. Analytical coming here, Dr. Kerry Jones coming on the podcast in July or so. And then we look at stool testing to see if there's a gut infection, because if the pill has then compromised your gut health, does that then predispose you to mm-hmm. leaky gut, which then predisposes you to gut infections, which then that may be the reason you're having a hard time conceiving. So it's kind of like the chicken and the egg, what came first? Yeah. So it's interesting that that gut health is obviously it's a huge buzzword right now. You know, look at your gut health, but um, it is super important. Yeah. And then, and then yes, with your, exactly. Yeah, yeah it definitely and, is. And then with the nutrient uh, deficiencies. Yeah. So it's interesting. I take my dog to a um, holistic vet and I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm walking the dog. I'm like, <laughs> she's barking at everybody. I'm like, Oh my God, this is so embarrassing. She's like a year old. I'd go to talk to my neighbors. She'd be like barking like a crazy thing. And the, so the vet's like, Oh, why don't mm. we just like, put a little bit of a, a little bit of B vitamins in in her food because she was just so anxious like I, I would I would hold a bag up and she'd be like oh, and you know start barking mm. um, and then I added these B vitamins and then she started getting all she was chill it was really interesting and I worked yeah. on training her with you know f- treats and stuff like too, that that too but the the whole she was just scared of everything and adding that little shot of of, of the B vitamins in the morning was was just interesting so I'm not sure how she got deficient because she's on raw food but just yeah with the lower B vitamins the pill can have you know could, could that then contribute to this this anxiety and depression and, and mental health like you talked about yeah and I think it's definitely that it's the flat lining of your hormones it's the low testosterone levels it's you know it's a lot of different things it's the effect on the endocrine system but yeah that's definitely a part of it Mm -hmm. yeah so it's it can affect vitamin levels your copper magnesium selenium zinc so yeah i wrote an article about this actually for hormones matters and um there's a Mm. a talk about the the nutrient the the nutrient levels in the gut health and um, what's your take on uh, methylation and the pill maybe potentially some of that that's yeah. another buzz word around here kind of is the is the mthfr genes so people are having a hard time methylating what's what's your take on yeah yeah so um i used to work with elisa Vitti, who wrote woman code and flow oh. living mm-hmm. um and we did actually collaborate on article about mthfr um, so i don't quite remember what she said about it in terms of the pill but I believe it had something to do with blood clot risk and the possibility of that um hmm or is it also gut health issues as well there's something there that basically I think if we were tested for it it, in similarly if we were tested for I just met somebody who had this over the weekend um there's a specific a genetic issue that some women have factor five leading, I think it's called, mm-hmm. which increases your chance of having a blood clot. Um, and there's certain things that if we tested for them, 
prior to um, suggesting the pill to women, if, you know, if we were ever as enlightened to do that as a society, then a lot of women could avoid a lot of the side effects, right? And so I think that that testing for that comes in under that as well, that if you have that issue, you might be more prone to having issues with the pill because of um, the effect on your gut health and vitamin levels and various things as well. That's my recollection of, of me working on that, but I'm certainly not an expert in that area. Yeah, that's a massive topic. Dr. Ben Lynch, his new book, uh, Dirty Genes, really goes into in depth about, he talks about the top six genes and one of them is the MTHFR. Mm -hmm. A lot of women that uh, experience re, uh, repeat miscarriage can have, can be positive for one of these genes. But it's interesting, yeah, if, if the pill is impacting your methylation and you also have that, how is then, you know, getting, be able to, to get toxins out of your body and, you know, how is that impacting? That's another huge topic, but a good resource is Dr. Ben Lynch and his new book, Dirty Genes, which I, I just love that book. Yeah. And Elisa mm. uh, Viti, Woman Code, that's another really good, it's just like a whole bunch of books, uh, <laughs> recommendations here, but yeah, her, <laughs> her, her book is awesome. Uh, Women Code, she's also, a, also a health, a health coach as well. And yeah, and then thyroid. Another thing that when people come to see me have a lot of women are struggling with hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's and how, yeah, how, what's your take on how the pill can impact thyroid health? Another massive topic. But. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> well, it's a very big topic, but actually that's come up more for me again with my work with Daisy, the fertility mm. tracker company, um, because uh, ba basal body temperature is what they, Daisy is tracking. Women take their temperature every day when they wake up before doing anything else. And that is a good way of diagnosing thyroid issues where blood uh, tests often don't work very well or the blood tests the uh, parameters for what's normal and what isn't are, and are very uh, changing all the time and they're not very effective so often using basal body temperature taking a basal body temperature every single day is a good way of figuring out whether you might have a thyroid issue and so that has actually led the researchers at the company um, to look more into that and what the issues are around that and they really see it as something of an epidemic to be honest I was just having this conversation when I visited the headquarters in Germany last month um, with their main researcher there, that they're seeing it a lot and it's often with women coming off the pill and that their temperatures are showing that there's a thyroid problem, that this seems to be something that is you know, quite common now, but very underdiagnosed. Yeah, and I, I actually interviewed Lisa Hendrickson Jack from the Fertility Friday podcast. I think you've been on there. Ooh, yeah. I love her. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's awesome. So she's on episode 20 of my podcast and we talk about the cycles and yeah, the impact. I think we mentioned about the thyroid as well. So that's a that's a good one to talk about. Yeah, that's interesting as to if it's I know it's all again, it's that chicken and the egg, right? Is does the pill then impact all these levels or was there some sort of pre something going on ahead, you know, beforehand? What? Yeah, and I mean, obviously, we're living in a more estrogenic environment all the time, plastics, chemicals in our cosmetics, our cl household cleaners, everything. I just this weekend was at the Goop event on Saturday, and it's mm. incredible to see like how many more women are getting clued into the fact as, oh, my nail varnish is an endocrine disruptor. Right. You know, I shouldn't be using those nail varnishes. Or my what I use when I, you know, my face masks or my uh, lipsticks, you know, and I really need to think through everything. Or one of the big things at this event was that women would be included into like perfumes and scents and how endocrine disruptive those, those can be. And being taught, taught about how, you know, to create your own scents from essential oils and things like that. And I think that's really interesting to me um, that that's definitely something that we're becoming more aware of. And obviously, we're taking an if we're taking the pill, you're taking an endocrine disruptor into your body every day. That's how it works. It's meant to disrupt your endocrine system. But we do also live in this sort of soup, right? Which I think we can honestly say we didn't really live in. So, you know, some when the pill was first released in 1960. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as so I say to people to check out their um, personal care products, you can go to the ewg.org and look at the Skin Deep database there and it can rate all your, the, your different products and you'll be amazed as to some of them kind of how they're rating and how they're impacting your body. So that stuff. And also it can be fun actually trying to find some new, you know, we don't, we don't say to throw everything out at once, but as you gradually transition over no. to more natural personal care, it's kind of a fun landscape, especially in 2018, of all the options that are out there. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. And I've done it very slowly. I mean, it took me a long time to come off the pill and then it took me a long time to finally stop using regular menstrual care products Mm -hmm. and switch to different options. And then, then it took me a long time to change up all my cosmetics, which has done wonders for my skin. And then to change up all my shampoos and everything. Like I didn't do it all at once. It's not like you suddenly go, oh, I get it now. You find things that work for you. And obviously you still use sometimes. I was just speaking at the the event with someone about this. You you might still use a mascara that really works. You know it works, but it's not that great. You don't have to be all or nothing about it. But if you just swap out like the majority of the things that you use are all the time that come in contact with your skin directly, like what you put in the bath and things like that. I think it can make such a huge difference. And now that I do do that, like when I see somebody in my life who isn't doing that and is still using the same old Johnson and Johnson or, you know, suave stuff or whatever. Um, it's like, it's just it gives me the shivers. <laughs> same here. I know. And before I'm like, Oh my goodness, I'm going to switch. I kind of thought before they were just kind of tree huggers and oh wow, Okay. And now I'm like, Oh, yeah, because like, because my mom was like this. We grew up. It was like vegetarian. Then she turned vegan. She had the string bags, and she was, you know, cleaning with vinegar. And I'm like, oh my god, you know, that's just so lame. And now, oh, okay, actually doing things naturally. There's a, <laughs> there's actually a, a reason, you know, there's a reason behind it. Why why do we want to put all these chemicals in our mouth and on our body? And you know, we're all on our own journey. And so to be able to come to it, it's not about perfection. No, definitely not. Mm -hmm. No. And the best thing is just to do as much as you feel you can and and, um, just be conscious about it, you know, and and not fanatical because I think being fanatical causes stress, which is also bad for you. (laughs) So best not to beat yourself up over things. If you want to go and get a pedicure with the wrong kind of nail varnish, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Just be aware that if you do that every two weeks, it's not going to be good for you. That's right. That's right. And what about specific pill brands that are that could be more harmful than others? So the um, the Depot Provera. I was on Diane thirty five, which I saw had some issues, and then the, oh the, yes, the, the terrible, Yasmin. yeah, yeah. I, that's they put when I was in my early twenties yeah. because of the, the acne. I was like, oh, let's go on Diane because it was supposed to be really good for acne. So what are some of the mm-hmm. ones that you're seeing that actually could be quite harmful? Yeah, so with um, Diane 35, I actually wrote an article all about that because that had a very much higher risk of blood clots than other brands and women weren't actually meant to be on it for longer than six months mm. total. Yeah, no. Um, but women were being left <laughs> on it for a longer, longer <laughs> periods. Yes, which is, you know, the that's, that's same in, in Europe, it was called Dianet. Um, and it was basically the same situation. Um, with Yaz and Yasmin, these are what we call third generation contraceptives. That's Yaz and Yasmin or Drospirinone containing contraceptives now, or Nuvering as well, the ring, and the patch, which is not really handed out much anymore. Third generation basically meant that they came up with new progestins to put into these products, which were supposed to have less side effects than the ones before. But what actually they found out over time, or probably, I mean, if we're honest, they knew already and they just didn't tell anybody, was that this had a significantly higher risk of very, very serious life-threatening side effects like blood clots leading to strokes, heart attacks, etc. And so through my work with the documentary, you know, I've met a lot of families who've had young women that have died from using Mm. these products Um, and young healthy women you know women without any other compromising factors at all so you know for me if I meet someone at a party and we have this conversation if they're on a third generation method like the Nuva ring or Drospirinone containing pill I will say well it doesn't if you want to stay on the pill that's fine but just please don't stay on those just change to a second generation which is an older brand like also tricycline or something because at least then you're skipping the totally unnecessary additional risk of the serious life-threatening side effects but you know you still have them but they're not as as high as with those third generation and because they're no more effective in terms of preventing pregnancy and usually no more effective in terms of doing anything else it's really was just a branding exercise for the pharmaceutical companies to bring out new products that they could then patent and make more money from So if you can avoid those, then you're doing yourself a favor in the long run and the short run. 
and those are definitely worse than other kinds with things like the implant the implant is actually being seen to be involved in a lot of mental health problems and also women finding it difficult to come off and regain their cycles with Depo-Provera I mean Depo-Provera really shouldn't be prescribed anymore I would say unfortunately it is and usually to young women usually women in marginalized groups economically or in terms of race are usually the ones that are prescribed Depo-Provera more often than anybody else and it has some awful side effects. It's basically a variant on what they used to give sex offenders to shut down their libido and it can be really hard to come off of, it can be really hard to regain your fertility, there are a lot of side effects you have on it and coming off it. You know, there's some, there's a, a friend of mine wrote a good article about that for Our Bodies Ourselves on the Our Bodies Ourselves website about Depo Provera, which is worth looking at. Okay. So, and so let's just, I just want to clarify with the third generation. So the third generation would be something like the Depo Provera, the Diane. No, no okay. So no. So dr- a, dr- a third generation are pills that contain drospirinone, which is a type of progestin. D-R-O is how it begins. Drospirinone okay. is a type of progestin that was created for these third generation pills so they could be patented, as I said. And then the Nuva Ring, which is still the Nuva Ring. I don't know if there are generics. There might be. And then the patch, which you don't hear about much anymore. These are the third generation and you those should be avoided because they have an unnecessarily high risk of blood clots and serious problems as a result of that in comparison to older brands of pill. And then the Depo-Provera has been around for a long, long time and is, you know, is, shouldn't be, I, I just don't think we need it as an option at all. I'm not into banning things, but I don't think it needs to be an option. And then the implant is becoming more and more popular in terms of prescription, the implant and the hormonal IED, because mm-hmm. they are what are called long, long-acting reversible contraceptives or LARCs, which doctors like because women don't have to remember to take them every day or switch them out every month with the ring or anything like that. Unfortunately, they're often presented as like, if you've had problems with the pill, take the, use the implant or the IUD and you'll be quite hormonal IUD and you'll be much happier. For a lot of women, that just isn't the case. It depends from woman to woman, but I think the implant, from my experience, seems to hold more side effects than the hormonal IUD. Some women can be okay on the hormonal IUD and really benefit from it, but some women have very similar side effects that they had on the pill when they're on the hormonal IUD. So it's just worth being aware that so really the, always the solution. And really blood, blood clot, stroke, heart attack, death. Yeah, but not with the implant and the hormonal IUD. You don't have the blood clot, clot, clot stroke, heart attack situation because there's no estrogen and there's no synthetic estrogen. It's progestin only, but that doesn't mean that you aren't having other side effects, including, you know, with the implant, with the IUD, it's things that are physical, you know, like migration of it, implantation into the uterine wall, uh, perforation of the uterine wall, PID, Mm-hmm. infections um, all those kind of things and then with the implant it's progestin only again but we're finding more and more through studies that progestin only options seem to have a uh, can have a bad impact on mental health as well so you are avoiding the blood clot issues with those but you're, you're not necessarily avoiding all the side effects the mental health anxiety depression panic attacks things like that um, yeah mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so how, how do we become our own advocate where, so this podcast is for women that are dealing with infertility. So maybe let's, we'll, we'll kind of go back to like a younger woman who's trying to figure out when to go on the pill at that stage, like, and then later coming off, how do, what, 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 you know, what do we do? But for someone younger, what's, how do we become an advocate for our own health? So I think just knowing how the pill works is really helpful to know that it isn't regulating your cycle, it is replacing, and to know that the hormones aren't the same as the hormones your body produces. These things are great to know up front, but I think the thing that can be the most empowering and a thing I wish all women were taught in high school is the basics of fertility awareness. So to know that we have a fertility cycle and that we're only able to fall pregnant as women on six days per cycle, that we have fertility signs, the basal body temperature, cervical fluid, and that you're able to map and track those things. 
and because if you have that kind of body literacy essentially then you much better understand how the pill works why it would have side effects you know for my my aim has never been that no women ever use the pill again my aim has always been that no woman suffer the same way that I did which mm-hmm. is unknowingly and for so long and not being able to make that connection and make the decision that's right for them and I think if you have the education up front if you then decide you do want to use the pill then that's up to you or if you want to have the IUD it's up to you of course but I think that education is important and right now we don't really have informed consent so we're not really getting to make that decision from an informed place so I think if anything if you have like yourself you should reading up about fertility awareness taking charge of your fertility if you have a teenager then the getting them cycle savvy by Tony Veshler is a really great place to start start tracking your periods getting to know your cycle because it can tell you so much about your health down the line too and I think just getting more acquainted with what's going on with your body and then making a decision from that place really yeah so cycle savvy by Tony Veshler I thought what's the other one by Tony Veshler the Taking charge of your fertility. Yeah, taking yeah. charge of your fertility. And then for someone that's that's coming off the pill, since what what is what's some advice you could have there to be their own advocate? Well, I think that your doctor isn't necessarily going to be encouraging. It's just the fact of the matter for most women. And you really have to be quite confident and resolute. And that might mean you want to take a partner or you might want to take a friend who you feel can back you up and help you if you're especially if you've been feeling kind of the, the side effects it can be hard to put it enough to talk up for yourself in that situation but it is your decision ultimately with the pill you can just stop taking it without consulting your doctor as long as you know you have no particular health issue that you went on it for if you were just using it for preventing pregnancy you can certainly if you have an IUD or an implant you, you know it's up, your doctor should be able to agree to having it removed on your schedule and not have a problem with that if you do I suggest finding a different doctor or going to a different clinic there shouldn't be any kind of issue with that if that's what you want to have done although I know some women do come up against that and then I think it's about just being really kind to yourself and you know not not doing anything special particularly but just eating well sleeping taking rest you know self-care I did a lot of sauna time and swimming when I came off the pill a lot of time in the sun and getting vitamin d and just being really kind to yourself um knowing that your body needs support to make its own hormones again and do what it does again which is not what it's been doing on the pill and then you know I think if you've read my book Sweetening the Pill then I always recommend you know picking up period repair manual from Lara Bryden to take that next step on if you do find you have trouble getting your period back and you can't afford to work with a naturopath yourself or take a course or something like that then do it just reading that book will be really really helpful. Mm -hmm. Great. And so let's kind of segue into, so you decided to become an ambassador for, then you've mentioned this before, the, the DAISY Fertility Monitor. So share with us your decision to work with them and, and yeah. your experience there. So obviously I've always been an advocate for fertility awareness or the fertility awareness method. And I spent many, many hours talking to journalists after my book came out about fertility signs and tracking your fertility and cycle awareness and body literacy. What I kept coming up against again and again was women who said, well, this is fantastic information, but I just am not motivated to do this every day, or it makes me uncomfortable, or I don't see myself having the time. And I was always asked, well, what can women do? What can women do that's basically a good replacement for the pill, but is not using synthetic hormones or having an IUD and something in your body? And I, you know, I came across state it was released in the US I think in 2014 the company has been around for 30 years they actually made the lady comp originally so that's kind of the precursor to Daisy I was introduced to it during the Kickstarter campaign for the documentary based on my book I found it really interesting because it basically simplified the concept of fertility awareness into something that women only had to commit to sort of a minute a day and they were getting a red or a green light as a status. So the red light meant you were fertile. The green light means you're not fertile. 
And it really just condensed it down into something that was that easy and simple and a device that was portable, manageable, attractive. They had access to all their information, but they also had access to a really great customer support team. What my main aim was always to help women come off the pill when they felt it was right for them. And I knew a lot of women were finding they wanted to come off the pill. They knew they had side effects, but they didn't think they had another choice. So they didn't want to come off and start using condoms again because they're in a long-term relationship or they didn't feel condoms alone were effective enough. They didn't want to go on an IUD uh, because they didn't feel comfortable with having something in their uterus. Then they just didn't feel... They felt overwhelmed when they'd been on the pill for a decade or so with the idea of learning fertility awareness and checking their cervical fluid and and understanding their charts and working with somebody who could teach them how to analyse their charts. That seemed like a very overwhelming step to take from going from a point of like knowing nothing about what's going on with your body and your fertility to having to do that. And so for me, the DAISY is kind of comes in between that. So it creates a real effective option for women who are only used to using hormonal contraceptives and don't want to anymore because of the side effects. They want to lead a different kind of lifestyle for themselves to make just feel better usually. And they still want to avoid pregnancy to a high effectiveness rate. It's 99.4% effective. And, you know, they need the support to do that. And that company is small enough, it's family run, that they do provide that. So, you know, that to me was like, well, I need to be able to advocate for something that is truly going to help women take this step. And, you know, I'm all for all women knowing about the fertility science from high school onwards. I wish we would do that in high school and again in college, have these classes and this option to learn about this. But in reality, reality you know women really need an option now that they're going to transition to and be able to swap to that's really going to help them make that decision for themselves right and it's also and for people that are are trying to get pregnant it also can help with that too right oh absolutely of course so it will give you a fertile window and then it gives you your ovulation prediction as well so you can over time the more data that you give it through your basal body temperature readings every morning the narrower that fertile window will become and the more specifically and targeted you can to to a time when you have sex to conceive as well and many women who've used the device to avoid pregnancy for a few months a year then swap to using it to achieve pregnancy and often find they get pregnant very quickly because they have so much data to turn to Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think you're offering our listeners a discount yes so if they just use my name holly h-o-l-l-y on the u.s site which provides sends out daisies through the u.s and canada now so you can use that discount code h-o-l-l-y when you check out and you'll get 20 percent off and what's the the url or the website for that it's usa.daisy and daisy is d-a-y-s-y it comes from daily synchronization rather than the flower Great. So usa.daisy.com. Dot me, actually. Not oh, com. sorry. Dot me. usa.daisy.me. Awesome. And we've, mm-hmm. I, I'd like to ask about uh, book recommendations and website or an app. We've, we've done a lot of book recommendations on the podcast. Is there any apps particularly? Maybe the, I think that Daisy has an app, doesn't it? Yeah, so Daisy syncs to an app, which is Daisy View, and it's a free app that you sync to. It gives you all your temperature data, charts, predict everything so you actually just use a little cord to put that on your phone i also really like clue is great if you're starting out and you how you have teenagers who are just starting out i also really like my moon time which is a great app if you kind of want to get your you know know about more about your cycle but also get more in touch with kind of the the nature connection of your cycle which i think is really nice for some women and uh yeah so th- those would be and then i and then I do, as I say, I've recommended lots of books already. Um, in terms of in terms of trying to conceive, I actually just saw you know a great uh, discussion with Erica Chidi Cohen, who runs the Loom Center here in LA. She has a book called Nurture and Loom. Actually, in LA, has a lot of resources. So, you, know, you can follow their Instagram, check out their website, so they're great as well. So L O O M. Yes. Mm-hmm. And Erica, what was her name again? Erica? Erica Chidi Cohen. 
Yeah. And she's fantastic because they offer classes for what they call people who are considering getting pregnant. So you can just learn more about your cycle and kind of get pre prepared for the idea of understanding your fertility and getting to know um, how to conceive, but also some of the obstacles you might come, across, come up against. They also have some classes for people who are trying to conceive and support right through to birth and onwards. So Excellent. And the apps were Clue and My Moon Time. And I think, you yes, have and then Daisy with the Daisy. The Daisy mm -hmm. Yeah, Daisy. Awesome. And any, um, is there a success story you'd like to share with, with us? I think it would be hard to isolate one success story. You know, it's nice that, you know, my book came out in or end of 2013. It's nice that I still get emails and messages now that are women saying, you know, that that gave them, sweetened the person confidence to go off the pill and that as a result that they feel so much better mentally or they are thriving in their career or they managed to heal their relationship or found a better relationship. And I get those, you know, two or three times a week still, which is really wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think I could isolate one. No, that's, well, those, those are fabulous. And you're also offering our listeners a free download of a, a resource list. Can you share a little bit about that for us? Yeah, so I've put this together because I started this year doing small workshops with women who are looking to explore coming off the pill, but from an emotional, psychological, relational standpoint. So we look at different things like how coming off hormonal contraceptives can affect your, your relationship, um, how feminism impacts on that decision, how uh, social pressure can impact on that decision, talking to your doctor, talking to your boyfriend or husband, um, and all, all from kind of that, my own background, essentially. So the resource list contains books, websites, fertility awareness instructors, tech recommendations, links to my own work, and ways to contact me as well. I'm very contactable. Awesome. And yeah, and I'm obviously keeping track of when you're, the film is coming out, which is, will be, I guess it'll be announced there on your, your website at some point. Oh, absolutely. And I also have a Facebook page for the book, Sweetening the Pill, just tap that into Facebook. And I update that times a week with new articles and research and definitely news about the documentary. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been super informative. I, I, this topic is very important for, for women to know, especially women that are dealing with fertility challenges. So I, I thank you very much for coming on and sharing your words of wisdom with us. Yes. Thank you very much for having me. It was great to chat. Great. Thank you. Hey there, Sarah Clark here. So are you struggling to have your baby? First of all, please know that my heart goes out to you. I support couples worldwide who are struggling with infertility to conceive and have healthy babies. Women like Rita, who gave birth to her beautiful daughter after following my fertility coaching system. Or Danielle, who after two failed IUIs was able to get pregnant after a supercharger fertility discovery call with me. So here's how you get my help for free. So I offer a free supercharger fertility discovery call. And on that call, I'll create a plan with you that is going to help you fast track your success. So this call is not for everyone and I'm really picky about who I get to speak with. And I have a strict but totally reasonable criteria that needs to be met in order for us to move forward. So here's who I can help. So first of all, you need to be able to explore your infertility diagnosis in a new light. So this offers for people who are open-minded, they're coachable, and if, you, and if you can do that and want to double or triple your chances at the fertility clinic or get pregnant, awesome. So let's get on the phone and chat. Also, you must be an action taker. So someone who's committed to seeing results, you're able to follow directions. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to do anything bizarre. But if you're one of those people who like to consume a ton of information, but don't like to spend time implementing and seeing results, then the call's not really for you. So I only want to spend time with people who are genuinely committed to their own success. So just click on the link in the show notes and apply. Or go to fabfertile, F-A-B-Fertile.com and click on the free consult. So it's a really short application that just tells me about your health, how long you've been trying to conceive, and how soon you'd like to be pregnant. So seriously, this is going to be the best time you've ever spent on your fertility. Looking forward to chatting. Talk soon. Thank you for listening to Get Pregnant Naturally. Seriously, it means the world to me that you're here. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can be notified of upcoming episodes. I'm excited to offer you a special gift. If you're a U.S. resident, text FERTILE to 345-345. You'll be prompted to enter your email address and you'll receive our fertility yoga download. 
In this 20 minute intro video, we focus on a calming and peaceful practice to connect back to your heart. These simple fertility yoga poses can help quiet negative thoughts and make you feel more in control. Download it now and get started today. So for US residents, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E, to 345-345. For non-US residents, go to www.yogafreebie, F-R-E-E-B-I-E, dot com to access your special gift. That's www.yogafreebie, F-R-E-E-B-I-E, Dot com to access the free fertility yoga download. And I love this quote by Dr. Mark Hyman, medical director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine and chairman of the Institute for Functional Medicine. Functional medicine is medicine by cause, not by symptom. Functional medicine practitioners don't in fact treat disease. We treat your body's ecosystem. We get rid of the bad stuff, put in the good stuff, and because your body is an intelligent system, it does the rest. Thanks for listening. Until next time.